communications and operations manager here. And we're just going to start the webinar just a tad bit early because the participants, the speakers actually have a question for you guys. And what is the leadership challenges you're facing today? If you guys just want to take a second to type something up in the chat feature, that would be great. And then in probably a minute or two, we will actually start the official webinar. Oh, Mary, we need to mention the resource um, handout, which Heather's going to give them at the end. Yep, I have that on the website. That will go live shortly. Okay. So if you guys are just joining us, um, this is Heather with NEMA. We did ask a question, um, if you guys want to take a second to fill that out, if you just um, joined us. And what are the leadership challenges you're facing today? There looks like there's a bunch of them over there. Okay, we have a good number um, starting now. We have a lot of people answering the question that we asked, um, the speakers asked. So I'll start again. Um, so this is Heather with New the New England Museum Association. Um, thanks for joining us for our July lunch with NEMA. It's hard to believe that it is the end of July. Um, today we'll be talking about critical issues of leadership in museums now with Ann Ackerson and Mary Case. Anne is the co-author of Leadership Matters, Thoughts on 21st Century Museum Leadership, and she also writes a blog on, about management and leadership issues for cultural institutions called Leading by Design. And Mary Case is the founding director of QM2. Mary consults with boards and senior staff on leadership issues to improve decision making and strategic initiatives and execution. Um, she's actually worked with NEMA on one of our board retreats. So we will, I'll just go a little bit over the overview of what's going to happen today. As you guys have noticed, we definitely want to be using the chat feature. So if you guys have any questions for Anne and Mary at all, please feel free to write something in the chat feature. And during the presentation, I will be interrupting them and asking any questions that come up. They will also be asking you guys questions. So we definitely want that, that participation um, from everybody because it is Something that we really encourage is the back and forth between the presenters and the participants today. And then I also want to bit, um, send out a big shout out to Museum Trek. They are sponsoring our Lunch with NEMA series this year. And you can also um, join us at the annual conference in November. They will be there in our exhibit hall. And just a reminder that um, today is being recorded. For people that weren't able to make it today, it will be on our website along with the PowerPoint presentation that Mary and Ann will be giving will be available. And they also have um, handouts at the end of the presentation that you can download from the NEMA website. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ann and Mary. Thanks very much, Heather. Uh, this is Ann Ackerson. I'm delighted to be here with you today. Um, we've got um, a, a lot to, to talk about, and hopefully we're well, we just know we're going to have some great conversations. So 
So I think, um, Heather, if you can take us over to our presentation. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. That would be great. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, just a brief, excuse me, um, just a brief little bit about me, and then I'll turn it over to Mary. Um, as Heather said, I've recently co-authored a book about Leadership Matters uh, in the History Museum, and, and that really uh, comes from uh, many years of being a small History Museum director um, and, uh, and kind of examining my leadership and what I have to bring to the table and what I don't have to bring to the table, and thinking about the training I might have gotten the development that I might have gotten or may still need um, as a veteran leader. Um, and so uh, that, that brought my co-author, Joan Baldwin, and I to the table to think really long and hard about leadership development and training in the history, museum, and cultural heritage end of the museum spectrum. Mary? Uh, thanks so much, Anne. And thanks to all of you for um, putting in those fantastic questions that um, we asked you to put in. Oh my God, you're all thinking about leadership in the most interesting ways. Uh, I hope we'll be able to address some of those questions as we go through today. Um, we'll be talking about the landscape of leadership, which is always changing and always challenging and always gra uh, grounded in risk-taking, holding authority, and the responsibility that goes along with it. We'll be looking brief briefly today about how to scale your successful efforts and contain the ones that don't work out so well. We'll be talking about how to hold the space for creative activity, which is so necessary for your R&D uh, and imperative to sustain your institutions and also su sustain your sanity, I think. We'll also explore the beauty of the Big Tent and the value of investing in diversity and the museum's place in the center of civic life your responsibility also to the future of the museums. We'll try to work in some of the answers to these questions that you've asked um, as we go through and whatever other questions that you um, put up here on the, uh, on, in the chat box as well. Um, uh, Mary, just to interrupt you, um, we just had someone that ha is in a very loud office, um, so if you could speak up just a tad bit. Okay. Um, Yes, I'll do everything I can to, to speak up. And if you are in a loud place, it would be a good idea if you could get out of that place. That would be an act of leadership, I think. Um, we hope that you will uh, do everything you can to get your questions answered today. And of course, Ann and I are both, you see our um, phone numbers here and our emails and we're both uh, available for questions and direct emails uh, afterwards. So by all means, um, uh, you know, do do whatever you uh, you know. You're welcome to um, to call us or email us after this event. So here we go. Okay. So what we've uh, decided to do is um, we we've chosen eight, as Mary said. We we've chosen eight sort of overarching critical issues in leadership that that we feel are important to talk about right now, and we've posed them as questions. Um, and the first one is from where does authority flow? I'm also just as a sidebar really um, heartened to see that the eight we chose are showing up a lot in your comments in the chat box. So in doing research for our book, my co-author Joan Baldwin and I learned that there has been and there continues to be a, a real shift from the traditional top-down form of leadership to one where authority is being spread throughout an organization. Leaders, successful leaders certainly, are, are looking to flatten the typical organizational chart. You know what that looks like where you've got leadership at the top and then you've got staff and maybe even volunteers, and they're all in neat little boxes and neat little columns that fall down from the leadership. I think that um, I think that this shift is being driven in part by the expectations of younger staff um, who are are coming into our organizations who have have every expectation that they will in fact have a say in what they do and how they do it. 
and um, several authors have talked about the democratization uh, that, is, that the web has brought us, where anybody can offer up an opinion on anything and, um, and is often listened to. I think our most successful leaders really are, are trying to figure out how, how to nurture leadership at all levels. And for Mary, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I did, you know, as Anne and I were talking about this, the reality is all of this, um, uh, 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 people don't give away their authority. Nobody does, ever. It's taken from them, or it's it's um, it's 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 accrued to somebody else in in the way that um, the so, so that the internet takes it from them, or or the electronics take the authority from them in some way. They don't willingly give it up. Uh, they may see that they they must share it because of some reason. So it's not that um, somebody's going to give you your authority, give the, their authority away. That doesn't happen. It's just not the way that that authority is, is um, uh, allowed. And in fact, the board and the CEO can't, you know, by law, really, by, by the way the the nonprofit is designed just hand off their authority. They can't do that. They can share it. They can devolve it. But they can't just give it away. Right. You know? So it doesn't flow easily. If they can if they see that authority can be shared in order to for more work to occur in a better way then it makes sense. If there's a way that they can justify authority being shared, if they can see that authority can be, it's actually responsibility that is given, not authority. So That's if you think point. about it that way, if you think yeah. about it that way, you might have the responsibility to do something, but not really the authority. And people get real, you know, they get real uh, confused about that they get really well I have the responsibility to do this but I don't have the authority well okay you have the responsibility to do it do it so you know those are two ways to look at that somebody might have the authority who is above you and allows you or 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 provides you with the responsibility to do it but they still keep the authority because it's going to come back to them that's a good point, Mary. Yeah. Why, why don't we take a look at our example? Sure. And uh, for, for every one of these questions we're posing, we, we're including an example to just kind of get your uh, creative uh, juices flowing here. And so the example that we have comes from the Oakland Museum of California. And the example is about turning an organizational structure from a rake into a flower. And you can hear Lori Fogarty, the director of the museum, talk about this at that website that's on the slide there at Arts Forward. But um, the, the point here being that uh, the museum um, was brought to thinking about restructuring after um, a couple of things, uh, budget cuts for one, big one, um, but also doing some uh, revisioning of, of the gallery and, and and really reaching out to the community, and actually we'll talk about that a little later. But um, she said, you know, our, our, our organizational structure was like that rake where the director was at the top and then the, the tines of the rake uh, constituted the various departments and so forth. And granted, this is a big organization, but I think the, um, I think the example is apt for an organization of any size. And in ter and how they restructured was really to think about the overlapping responsibilities of individuals and departments and what that might look like. And they came up with this, this flower concept where they, they, put, they put the director and her board put themselves at the stem and the bottom of the flower because they feel that they are the, they are the 
sustainers of the work of the organization. That that's their responsibility. Uh-huh. And and so they've they flipped it right around. But then they've also created this overlapping um, pedal formation uh, that I think actually maybe probably more accurately describes how they work together and how they want to work together. May I break in too? You think you can. Yeah, this is so interesting because the Oakland Museum is it's four museums. It's four it's a it's a museum that is built on a I think it's a square block. Maybe it's two square blocks, but it's certainly a square block with four museums on each corner. In the center is a park. In the 60s, it was built in the 60s or the 70s, something like that, out of concrete. And the park is above the concrete. Nothing happened to this museum for 40 years when Laurie took over. So you can imagine that the park leaked into the concrete, into and over the concrete. Um, so, and no, no infrastructure stuff was done for all of those years. So she had to go and do everything, replace everything in that building, including fix all the leaking. You can imagine that the flower motif, four petals, bringing this organization together, it's all underground. It's mostly underground. People lived in the 60s and the 70s and smoked dope in that park for decades. So it's, you know, it's San Francisco, or it's across the bridge from San Francisco. So the whole idea of fl- flower power, <laughs> it makes so much sense for that place. And it makes, it makes a, the perfect metaphor for what we're talking about today in terms of leadership in that each of you have to think about your own organization and what makes sense for your own organization. What is the history of your own organization? Go back to your founding documents motivating your team through organizational change, lack of leadership positions in your own organization, finding new ways to motivate a team. This comes from your foundational documents, your place. Being in a museum is about place. Being in a nonprofit is about place. I would like to just add on to that, Mary, by saying that I think that um, looking at organizational charts or creating organizational charts is an excellent exercise yeah. to begin that, the intellectual conversation about how we want to work together and get, how we want to get work done. And for those of you who have organizational charts, I, I urge you to go back to them and start to fiddle around with them. Yeah. And for those of you who don't have an organizational chart, it's nothing more than a graphic representation of how communication and authority flows through an organization. And so draw, draw it out the way it, the way it really is. <laughs> and then you can begin to think about how do we really want it to be. Exactly. So every director that I know has the org chart in his or her mind the way it really is. And then they have an aspirational chart. Mm -hmm. And they have a chart with the people in the chart. I mean, they have the positions in the chart. And sometimes the people that they have working for them are in the wrong positions. And they're hoping that they will be able to move those people from one position to another to get them better, better situated. And the people in those positions they would like to be, some of them would like to be in other positions as well. Mm -hmm. So getting to a place where you have enough honesty in your system to be able to say to your colleagues, hey, you know, I'm in the wrong job. That's one of the ways that you find new ways to motivate a team, navigate leadership change, staff and board through, through the organizational change developing ways in which you can be honest with each other. That's the way to do this. Now, you can't actually um, do an org chart until you have clear mission, clear vision, and clear values. Doing the structure of an organization comes after those mission, vision, values, and you have leadership in place. So one of these questions here have something about uh, 
Why don't we go to our next slide? Yeah, good. Good. Oh, is success scalable? Hmm. All right, well, that brings us, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go to a different thing about success here. Scalability comes and is, comes from understanding what, this is the way I look at scalability anyway, internally to the museum. So scalability comes from looking at what is internally successful. And by that I mean, a really careful examination of what's working and why it's working. So in every organization, some things work really well. So maybe it's facilities management is working really well. Or maybe it's your education programs are working really well. Or maybe four out of the last 10 exhibitions that you've done over the last six years were really successful. So. Why is that? What are the success, success factors in those three areas, if they are the three areas in your organization, that are working really well? So you sit down, a group, the leaders in that organization, you sit down, why are those areas working really well? What are the success factors in those areas? That's what you, you, you work on then. What are those success factors? Let's do more of that in all the years. That's one way to think about success scalability. Once you get success scalability working really well in all of the areas in, of your institution, so that would include fundraising, registration, collections management, et cetera, et cetera. If you got, say you got um, 80 instead of 30% of all the areas of your institution highly successful, now you can scale your institution up even bigger than it is now. Yeah, I would say having, having that success criteria articulated is so important uh, because it, um, it can impact how, how the, all aspects of your organizational, or organization functions. It can also help you, I think, determine um, what outside ideas are workable in right. your organization. And um, I, I really think that the best ideas out there are, are scalable ones, number one. Right. Uh, but first you really need to know uh, if, 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 you, if, you, you, if your criteria is pointing in the direction of saying, yeah, let's, let's try this. We think we can, we can do this. Um, I think that um, you know, as a leader, You've got to be really open uh, to drawing ideas from everywhere, um, out of out of different aspects of your institution as well as from other institutions, both in the nonprofit, the for-profit, and the public sector. Right, absolutely. Here's a little idea that I saw this past week at Williams College, which I think is uh, scalable or replicable. They have something at Williams College called roving office hours. Now, this works really well at a university museum, but I think it could work at almost any museum. I love the fact that there's a, there's a Saul Lewitt that you can see on the back of the wall here. Um, the staff members from 1.30 to 3 o'clock, there's always a staff member in the gallery. So what they do is they bring out, they sit at an office desk, and they bring out their work. It could be an educator. It could be a facilities guy. It could be a registrar or curator or the director. For an hour and a half every day, there's one person from the museum who sits there. There's two chairs in front of that desk. And that visitor could sit down and talk to them about anything. It doesn't cost the museum anything. Office hours. Yeah, I think it's a great scalable project. Yeah. So, so easy. So easy. Just a small thing. Yeah. So let me go to the next slide. Here. Oh, I got it for you. Oh, you did? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, no, right, now we're back. All right. <laughs> I will stop. Okay. <laughs> so another really important part of leadership 
no matter where you sit on that organizational chart we are talking about, is where is the space or how, where, where is your opportunity for creative work? All of us need that. And all of us need to create that for those of us who are around you. So maybe you're a department head, maybe you're a department of one, maybe you are the CEO. How are you creating time in your day or in your week to have a creative opportunity, to, to have time to reflect on your work for creativity? So uh, one of the things that I'm involved in is something called ICE, a name that I totally love. It's called the Institute for Cultural Entrepreneurship done through Cooperstown Graduate Program um, through, through a grant from IMLS and support from others. The, the idea with ICE is that we're, we're working at the uh, mission margin, the spine of mission and margin, trying to help people create, to become entrepreneurs or sharpen their entrepreneurial skills, to take an, a project which is mission related and make it higher on the margin or take a, a project which is highly margin, has a very good margin but make it more mission related. The idea is a true retreat. That's the important part of, of creativity is a true retreat. How to get away for three hours, for instance. How to get away for uh, two hours in your day, how to reflect on what you work. So the question becomes, how do you reflect? And that's yeah. my question to you uh, in, our, in our group. I'll just could, throw in could, here, if that's okay, that you know, most new projects aren't fully formed at their inception. You know, think of the, of your exhibitions, your interpretive tours and programs and all of that sort of stuff. They all take time to develop. You know that very well. And they need a space for experimentation. And they need a space for the what ifs to be asked. Yeah. And I would, I would just say that I think a leader's, uh, a leader's job, whether you're the director or whether you're the chief curator or the only curator or you're the curator educator, is – Make, is really make, trying to make a space and keep that space open for um, creativity to happen. Mm -hmm. now I here's... do have one question for you guys. Let me interrupt, sorry, on yeah. that one. Um, regarding the last slide, um, how is calculated risk and, and failure is part of the creativity? How do you convince the board that it's okay? Because I know uh, that's something that's calculated a risk. times. Calculated risk and failure is okay. <laughs> okay, so there's a wonderful book which is called Uncharitable. Uncharitable. Right. Uh, and who wrote that book? Tell me. Dan Pilata wrote it. Dan Pilata wrote the book. Uh, Unfortunately, he's not on our resource list, so let me just type that in. Yeah. Go ahead, Mary. So, so the idea is the board is reluctant always to take a calculated risk because it's not their money. Uh, so there's a number of ways to be thinking about the money. If you can't, if you if you're having trouble convincing them to take a calculated risk, it's because they don't trust you. So, how do you get someone to trust you? That's the question. you have to have a very strong relationship with certain people on the board. You have to go out and raise money, perhaps, for calculated risk to get them to set aside a certain amount of money for calculated risk. You have to talk about, over a long period of time, some, and what is a long period of time? I don't know in your case, you know, in the case that we're talking about. But you have to talk about what is a calculated risk. An entrepreneur does not believe he is taking a risk once he makes the decision. An, or she, 
an entrepreneur believes that they have worked through all the risk and is pretty sure when they make the decision that it's going to work. And, you know, that's key, Mary, uh, working through the risk. I, I think no director, no leader can just go to their board and say, let's do this without the game plan. Yeah. You have to do the homework to minimize the risk and get it small yeah. enough so that people are comfortable. Yeah. This is this is one of the most upsetting and and this is one of the biggest problems with uh working in a nonprofit when you know you could make money if they would let you spend money. Yeah. And as we were talking earlier about the uh the organizational chart the leadership in place, all of that sort of stuff. If you have a board that is holding you back and you know that it's holding you back, you might have to go as far as replacing the board. That is maybe what you have to do. And that takes three years at a minimum. It might take longer. So, you know, that's that's the re- reality of it. Now here, let me look at... Let me tell you about Historic Hudson Valley. Historic Hudson Valley has five wonderful historic houses that it manages. One of them is Kikit, the Rockefeller Center, or the Rockefeller Estate, but they have three, four other ones. This project, this program that they have is called Blaze. Uh, they get 80,000, they got 80,000 people a year coming by uh, at ten dollars a pop, so that's a lot of money. That's eight hundred thousand uh, dollars. In order to do that, they had to restructure the um, the events managers because each house had events people, but they couldn't run a program for eighty thousand people with just a few people. They had to, you know, they had to really restructure those events people from all the houses and put them all on this big project. What they found was they had a much more creative opportunity when they put those people together. That's where they found a place for creativity for those events people when they put them together. Creativity does not happen when you only have one or two people sitting together in a room. It just doesn't happen that way. So they put them all together. They were able to do this huge event. They came to ICE because they wanted to see if they could tie that event to even a greater a greater uh, number of people without putting more stress on the property where they do it. Uh, then they were also looking to see what they could do to launch something in the spring, not as big as not as big as Blaze, but something that would be really wonderful. They were they needed the time to retreat and think about doing something like that. So after they were with us for ICE, they were able to bring in 100,000 people the next year without additional stress and to to launch something in the spring. These projects are money makers. That's a million dollars, 100,000 people. I don't know. That's a lot of money. They, they, They are mission tied and margin tied. That's the ideal project, you know, that each of you want to do when you're thinking about working in a nonprofit. You want a mission tie and a margin tie, and you want to absolutely make sure that your board understands every every stage along the way. So, yeah. Okay? Okay. Um, Josephine has a comment here, um, and I think we can address that a little bit later. Um, she she is uh, here today because she is wondering how museum staff might work more specifically to contribute to a stronger global voice. And we will talk a little bit later about getting closer to the sort of civic engagement piece. Uh-huh, yeah. So uh, let's, let's hold on that for just a, a moment, and um, I'll... I'll go to our next issue, which is what support, what qualities support leadership and sustainable institutions? And I'll kick this off by, by, by saying uh, what you can see, and that is leadership is about embracing change. And we, 
knowing what we know about the dramatic external change that is, is affecting museums today, not only in our own communities, but across the country and around the globe, as Josephine points out, it's imperative that institutions be agile by having a game plan that employs multiple interchangeable elements. Leaders must be comfortable with constantly developing uh, several strategies at the same time and encouraging staff and volunteers to do the same. And I'll just, I'll just share with you a, a short little example. Uh, Michael Kaiser, who's the f former uh, president and CEO of the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, um, uh, traveled around the country and talked about sustainability of arts organizations a few years ago. And one of the things that he shared with us is that whenever he goes uh, to visit a, a donor or a potential funder, he has in his pocket a list, a list of potentially fundable projects. He goes in with one project that he pitches, but if the donor doesn't really warm up to that, he's got five more sitting in his pocket that he will trot out until he makes a match. This is what I this is kind of the, the behavior of a leader who is thinking uh, of a game plan with a lot of interchangeable parts and does it all the time. And let me also say that uh, when Joan and I worked on the book, we identified four personal qualities among the leaders we interviewed for our book, and we talked with 36 people across the country in Canada. And those four, that, those four qualities that rose to the top are authenticity, using your own stories to um, to, to, to show the way uh, uh, through organizational work, being self-aware, knowing what you know, what you don't know, knowing when to ask when you need help, courage, and vision. All of these qualities facilitate successful change management. Mary? Uh, yeah, we just wanted to mention the um, Children's Museum and Theater of Maine in this context because what they did there is they merged uh, the the uh, theater there, which was struggling a little bit, in with the Children's Museum because the Children's Museum has been there a long time and was doing well, but it was and it was was not going to allow the the theater to um, continue to struggle and perhaps you know not exist anymore. So they merged and. Um, this strengthened the Children's Museum in ways that uh, it didn't realize that it was going to strengthen the Children's Museum. And the two organizations that are now thriving and, in fact, uh, maybe moving together into a, you know, maybe uh, launching uh, into a larger space. I'm not sure about that, but it's really wonderful to um, know that they're working together so well. Uh, so that's what, this, that's what, ha what is happening with them. And it sounds to me as though the museum director there really was the the driving force. The museum director at the Children's Museum yeah. was well, the driving force uh, behind. Yeah, emerging. absolutely. Absolutely, I would say that's true. So our next issue, do your employees and volunteers reflect your community? And how important is that? Diversifying boards, staff, and audiences is not something an institution has to do. But today's successful leaders recognize that it's an investment in long-term institutional sustainability. I, I happen to love Arnold Lehman's quote, um, the most important book a museum director can read is the US Census. I heard him say that probably 15 years ago. Um, but it, it's meaningful when you consider that the home of the Brooklyn Museum is one of the most diverse communities in the United States. So you understand now why he, keep, why he says it and keeps saying it. Diversity can come in all colors, shapes, sizes, ages, economic brackets. It's about stretching, what it truly is about is about stretching beyond an institution's four walls, about creativity and about making impact. Um, this is about this is about as a leader popping up out of the foxhole and looking around and seeing who else is out here who we need to, who we need to talk to and, and bring in and uh, so that we're not all the same foxes in the hole <laughs> all the time. Hmm. Um, Mary, do you want to add anything to No, I don't, to but you, you have this wonderful um, uh, 
comment on uh, uh, the Gardner Museum. The Gardner, and, and if somebody's on, on the webinar from the Gardner, we'd love to hear more about this. Uh, we chose the Gardner um, because of this interesting project that they're involved with, and um, I'm sure many of you might have heard of it. It's the Commonwealth Compact, which is Massachusetts' attempt to diversify an attempt to diversify the Massachusetts workforce. And um, it is a nonprofit organization. It's connected with UMass Boston, uh, has its own website, which is there. And, and it's a membership-based organization. Uh, and when you join, you commit to um, Im improving uh, the way you uh, recruit. This is, this is about recruitment for boards and staff maybe volunteers too. Uh, I'm still learning about it uh, myself, but I find this fascinating. Um, in any event, uh, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum is a member of the Commonwealth Compact and uh, annually measures and reports progress and reports that back um, to the Compact. So um, certainly um, self-aware leaders at museums uh, saw someone at the Gardner was self-aware enough as a leader to see the uh, opportunity here to establish some success criteria around hiring and uh, board recruitment. And uh, in doing so, they're holding the institution accountable to this. So until our museums are, are willing to make this type of commitment, many of them, I think, will be unable to shake off the elitist image that we have been saddled with, uh, particularly from the media the public and elected officials who tend to characterize us um, as being elitist. Uh, and it's something I think that the, that the field as a whole has, a, has attempted rather poorly, I might add, to shake off for gosh, what, the last 40 years? Enough said on that, I think. Okay, let me just go forward here to um, the question that we have, what places your museum at the center of civic life in your community, this um, brings me to a, a question of you know each of each of our museums have some visitors who really care about us. If we had a lot of visitors who really cared about us, we wouldn't ever be struggling with finances. So the question that I have for you is, what would the visitors who really cared about you? What would they say about you? What would the visitors who really cared about you, what would they say? This goes back to what I was saying earlier about the, the success criteria. So those visitors, what would they say? And how can you get more of them? If you got a lot of them, you really wouldn't be struggling. And you would know exactly what you needed to do. You know, Mary, this is a question that has dogged museums for decades, maybe even a century now. I'm thinking, you know, of John Cotton Dana uh -huh. back in the early 20th century. I'm thinking of Excellence and Equity, uh -huh. the monograph published in the early 1990s. And now, of course, more recently, I'm thinking about all the, all the writing of Stephen Weil and, and now what Nina Simon is writing about. Um, you know, there are any number of museums that are, are seen as necessary to their communities. And, and certainly Nina is helping to create a roadmap for us. Well, I think uh, Josephine with her Patterson is, is, um, is itching up on this question too, really. I mean, that's a very big question that she's gotten, that mm -hmm. she's got on the table right here. Mm -hmm. in, here in D.C., the National Building Museum exemplifies this. The trick, or it's not a trick, the, 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 uh, the difficulty is the pool has to be large enough to support the institution. And sometimes the institutions are already too big. They have too much real estate and too many collections, for example, to you know, find a pool large enough in their communities to you know, do the financials that are necessary to support them. So mm -hmm. that's part of the issue which is one of the reasons why the Chattanooga example is such an extraordinary example. 
here here we have a story of a children's museum, very small, you know, three million dollars a year, uh, a an aquarium, large, twelve fifteen million dollars a year, and the Hunter Art Museum, maybe three four five million dollars a year, something mm-hmm. like that. But what happened here is that the children's museum opened and missed all its numbers. Two, two, two blocks from the aquarium. They had a board member in common. And the board member said to the director of the aquarium, could you help these guys? So the director of the aquarium sent the CFO over to the Children's Museum and said, I will take all of your back of the house stuff for X dollars a year. So for twice the amount of work, and half the amount of money, the Children's Museum got all the services of a highly competent CFO's office, all the HR stuff, all the all the budgeting, all the back-of-the-house services. And that worked very well for a couple of years. And then the hunter got a new director, and he went into his 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 uh, finance office and found them using quill pens and so he went went over to the aquarium and said could I talk to you same thing for half the amount of money he got twice the amount of services so the CFO of the aquarium became the CFO of all three places he went to all three board meetings he was a gotten for punishment off obviously but he became the CFO for all three places the CFO's office of the aquarium now becomes an income stream. The the jobs of the aquarium become much more interesting jobs. And he can hire much more competent people. And the aquarium and the, and the hunter, they can do much more uh, interesting work because they have much more competent uh, financial things, you know, a much more competent financial team behind them, much more strategic team behind them. And it's costing them a lot less money. So then Bob Corker gets elected mayor of Chattanooga. And he looks around and he says, I have to redo the downtown of Chattanooga. So he goes to the three directors and he says, I want to do the downtown of Chattanooga and I want you guys to help me. And the three directors think to themselves, oh my God, I'm going to have to open my donor list which is exactly what they do because they care about place. And that's what I mean when I say that each museum is about place as much as it is about the content of their collections or the content of their scientific work or whatever it is that they're doing. That's what they're about, is about place. Mm -hmm. And those four people, uh, I was going to say men, yeah, those four men, they're all men, sat in a room for six weeks and they raised... $145 $145 million in six weeks. Some of it was federal, some of it was state, some of it was city. A lot of it was um, privately raised. All three places raised at least twice as much as they sh- they thought they could raise, it's, as their feasibility studies said they could raise. Plus, downtown Chattanooga got completely renovated. Plus, Bob Corker got elected senator. <laughs> he's here in Washington with me. Uh, well, it's interesting to to note that uh, the director of the Hunter, Rob Kratt, uh is one of uh, our interviewees in our book and uh, has gone on to the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum in Santa Fe and exactly. is is attempting to do something similar there in Santa Fe and uh, admitted uh, to me in, a, in in the interview that uh, it hasn't come together. And that Santa Fe is just a different kind of city, and uh, it's it's the, there are a lot of cultural institutions in Santa Fe, and everybody has their own kind of piece of the pie, and they're hanging on to that piece of the pie. And he doesn't know if he can bring about that kind of change where he is now. But I thought that was interesting that you know in some in some cases it's the place the place makes it or breaks it. Well, that's what I mean. What I meant when I was talking about the the rake and the flower, and why the flower works in in Oakland. 
is exactly what you're describing with Rob. It is about place and the wise museum director, the wise leader registrar, the wise leader educator understands the place where they are, where they come from, and is able to craft something that works in that place. New England, where I, I work frequently, is much different than Washington, D.C., where I don't work very frequently. Washington, D.C. is a very, very difficult place to work, mm -hmm. to make change. It's a very difficult place to make change, which is, uh, you know, which is what I do. New I England is, makes one kind of change. You can make one kind of change. You know, you can make a couple of kinds of changes in New England and in Pennsylvania and in New York State. But they're different. They're different places. You know? Chattanooga has a history of cooperation yeah. with each other. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll just throw in one quick example from kind of the other end of the museum uh, spectrum. And this comes from the Ukraine and the fact that with the, the fighting going on there, you know, night after night, we sat and watched uh, uh, Kiev, um, parts of Kiev, um, and um, with rioters and, and police and so forth. And the museums, which are state run for the, for the most part, um, you know, some, some museum uh, professionals are trying to figure out what their role is in documenting this unrest. Mm -hmm. And it's very nascent, and who knows what will happen or where it will go. That whole thing is so in flux. But it is not the only it is not the only place in the world where museums see they have a role to play somehow. But I think a lot of a lot of them are just feeling their way along. Um, Amy's got a great question out there too. Um, I don't know if we want to take that now, Mary. I'm going to tell it. Wanna... Here's the answer, Amy. Laugh out loud. <laughs> just laugh out loud. God. What can I say? Awful. I wonder if we could. Uh, I wonder if we could. Um, if we should just, I wonder if we oh, should just not. end with George Sparks. Um, we have a you know a bunch of other slides, but I wonder if we should just end with yeah. George Sparks' video, and then we could uh, do something for Josephine. Just say something about what Josephine and, and just yeah. you know bag the rest of our slides. I love George Sparks' video. Okay, could, hold on one second. Let me. Yeah. Okay. Let me just set it up. I can set it up a little briefly uh, beforehand, and that is one of the core values of museums is about longevity but uh, we tend to be around a long time but as employees first and off philosophically and i think museum, you should we're just hire... only passing through on our way to something else so the institution remains and yet so many of us and myself included have failed to think about um, what we leave behind for those coming to our museums after us so the lack of planning for succession imperils forward momentum i believe and george is going to talk a little bit about that Okay, so this is the first time we've done the YouTube video. Um, okay. So may or may not. First of all, philosophically, all right. I think you should hire people that are smarter than you, that push you all the time, that and you know that, that can replace you someday. So um, as yeah, opposed to people that you can yeah, control can. or you're, Sorry, if you're always the smartest person in the room, that's bad. I you're probably you. not going why to be very stop, effective. Why don't you stop this and just give the for okay. poor later time and yeah, we I did do put have it there and then yeah. I can also put it on the website for people to yeah, listen to. We have I forgot that the people on the phone aren't able to hear it since it's right. part of the presentation. Yeah. Okay. So um we summarize it then and okay. Um, cuz we do have it on the next slide, right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll give it you can you can look it up. We love him. We love this guy. He's fantastic. And then we'll just talk, talk for a few minutes uh, after Ann summarizes it about Josephine's issues and the other questions that we have. Yeah. Um, uh, this video comes from the website National Arts Strategies. And you'll find there uh, just a ton of short videos about all kinds of uh, arts organizational, cultural organizational issues. And George Sparks has several of them. And basically in this video that we'd chosen for today, he talks about how you need to think consciously about who's going to succeed you and not shy away from it. 
And he's the CEO of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. He tells us that he hires people who can push him and, uh, and who he sees might actually replace him someday. And that he needs to um, provide them with opportunities so that they can grow, that they can grow within the organization and maybe ultimately grow into the CEO spot. Um, and he feels that, you know, we all need to be really upfront and open about what change will mean for the organization and what uh, change will uh, transpire once we leave the organization. Hard conversation to have. And, um, and sometimes it's not always opportune to have it, but I think we need to do a much better job of, of thinking about that continuity as, as people move in and out of the organization. Good, and thank you. Uh, Josephine, I just want to make sure that you know about the group called Museums of Conscience, uh, which you can check on the internet. There's about, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 museums that yeah. uh, are related to the issues that you bring up. I was recently at the Eastern State Penitentiary where they're working on issues of incarcerated people in this country. We have... Um, 2.2 million men uh, incarcerated in this country, which is far and away above every other country in the world per capita. So that's one. That's what. I, that's where I would look first to um, find kindred spirits on that issue. And there are some kindred spirits out there, both in this country and abroad, who are. Um, they've started a blog called. I think it's called something like Museums and Politics something like that, mm -hmm. and, um, and they're somehow, I, I'm sorry I'm so nebulous about all of this, but they're, they're, put, they're involved in some conference that's going to be taking place in St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, this fall. Um, so um, I would certainly, um, you know, troll the web to see what might be out there. Somebody also asked about building my own abilities my own leadership ability, abilities in the museum field, I think that the best place to do that is through NEMA, the NEMA conferences, the NEMA um, associations of uh, professionals. My own career was built on MAM's uh, group, and um, the best way to do that through NEMA is by volunteering uh, with whatever uh, association, you know, with, if it's registrars or educators or whatever, volunteer put up your hand, do work, you will build your leadership abilities in that way, I think, in a very best I, way. I, I totally agree with that. In fact, one of our uh, interviewees for the book, uh, the uh, CEO, Van Romans, the CEO of the Fort Worth uh, Museum of uh, Science and History, said, basically said it in a nutshell. He said, say yes. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> when you are presented with an opportunity, say yes. Um, there's a question here about uh, completed the capital campaign, planning for my for what might happen due to results of the campaign. This is a very interesting question. There are three places where the uh, development director and the board, uh, sorry, there there are the development director off, often leaves after the end of the capital campaign. The board or the CEO often leaves after the end of a capital campaign. That's because they both get what is known as crispy. They get crispy. <laughs> uh, that means that they have overpromised, or <clears throat> other people think they have overpromised as a result of the capital campaign. So whoever wrote me that could call me or email me, and we could talk more about that offline. Well, you know, capital campaigns are killers. No, there's no two ways about it, and, and the whole organization is, is geared up, you know, for it, and usually for long, long periods of time. And it's um, it's a killer. I think I think leaders have to think about how how they bring an organization back to back to the ground after a successful campaign, uh, and to, and to really think about the care and feeding of staff and volunteers throughout the campaign. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We didn't get to everything. I'm so sorry about that, um, but we are more than welcome to speak to you, either of us, and uh, we hope we will hear from you. 
Heather, do you want to say anything before we close? Yep. Um, just want to say thank you to both of you. Um, the slides for the presentation are also on the NEMA website now in the resource list that we mentioned earlier. And I've also put the link up for the YouTube video so everybody can get that. So that's under the Lunch with NEMA section on the NEMA website. Um, I, do you guys have any, anybody that's a participant have any final remarks or anything they want to have asked? We are kind of running out of time, and so we did cover quite a bit. And I want to say thank you to Museum Trek for sponsoring us today, and also Anne and Mary for giving your time um, today, because I know this is very helpful for all of us involved today. Um, we love doing it. Love having you guys. <laughs> and then, as um, you know, Mary mentioned earlier, we NEMA is always looking for volunteers. Um, you know, for our workshops, for conference. Um, if you do have an interest in giving a lunch with NEMA, we're always looking for people to do that, too. Um, and, you know, we are calling people around sometimes. It's like if we hear someone doing something really cool, we usually ask them to help us out in one way or another for a presentation or writing an article for our journal and stuff like that. So NEMA is definitely, if you're looking to expand your network, give us a call. Um, I will plug NEMA quite a bit on that one there, and BJ will definitely be very interested in that one. So do you guys have any final words you want to say? Nope. <laughs> it's been our pleasure to, to do yeah, this. Been our pleasure. And uh, it's always good to think about these issues because, you know, you don't often get the chance to do that. So it's fun. Thank you. All right. And um, just a reminder that the YouTube video will be uh, probably in the next day or two on the NEMA website, too, if you guys wanted to relook at that or share it with other people. So that will be there. And I guess in closing, uh, make sure to join us next August, um, at the end of August, um, for the next lunch with NEMA. And we'll be posting information about that particular lunch um, in the next week or so. So we look forward to seeing you guys in the next one. And thanks again for everybody. Thank you.